Hi everybody, thanks for coming along. Uh, it's great to come here. I didn't have a clue what the campus was like and as I walked in, I was just going, this is beautiful. I could hear music everywhere, so you're very, very lucky to be here. Um, yeah, today I'm going to, it's basically going to be a practice focused discussion really. I'm going to talk you through um, sort of the approach that I have been taking to using mainly social media um, in learning and teaching, um, highlighting some of the issues uh, that may arise and hopefully um, giving you some ideas. Um, always open to questions, so I'll definitely just check, my, check how I am for time. Yeah, I'll make sure to leave time for questions at the end. Um, also, I'm Haluki on Twitter, so if you want to ask any questions via Twitter, just tweet me um, and I can see them right here now. So, um, yeah, I'm going to touch on sort of six themes today really. Firstly, uh, the idea of digital identities. What does that mean for our learners? What are the benefits? What are the challenges of digital identity development in education? Um, everything I do really is based on open educational practices, openness in terms of open platforms, um, open ideologies, and that's going to underpin everything really, um, which will lead us into uh, digital pedagogies, um, such as students as producers and the use of mobile devices um, as creative tools. So thinking about mobile learning not just in terms of delivering micro chunks of content to mobile devices but how learners can really use the devices in their pockets in teaching and learning situations on a day-to-day -day basis. And then finally I'll have a look at internationalization through networks um, and learning across disciplines. So basically the use of technologies to connect with uh, learners at different levels, different institutions and different disciplines around the world. So um, before I start, I just want to highlight a really useful kind of conceptual tool from Bonnie Stewart in Canada. Now, Bonnie does fantastic work um, in the area of digital identity and network learning. It's well worth checking out her blog on a regular basis. She's a very open practitioner, shares her thoughts, her fears, her concerns, and I found her incredibly inspirational. Now, this comparison here is very, very useful when we start to think about the use of digital media technologies in learning and teaching because we start to move away from the left-hand column, the traditional model of higher education, and moving into something that is much more network focused. And so I'll be touching on these themes today, themes around participation, crowdsourcing, who is the audience when we start to operate on a global stage, when we work in you know, a network society with our learners. It's the world, it's no longer the teacher. So these kinds of ideas um, underpin the rest of the talk, really. First of all, um, I will just give you a bit of background because, um, I th yeah, I just should explain who I am really and why I do what I do. Um, I've been based at the University of Salford for 15 years now. I'm actually based in acoustics, in computing science and engineering. And when I started at the university, I was much more on the kind of hard computing side of things. Um, and over the years, with the rise of social media, social software, um, it's really kind of pushed my pr practice and pushed my thinking. And now I do something very, very, very different. But I'm very lucky in that I'm still part of computing science engineering in the acoustics department because what I'm able to do now is work across the arts and the sciences because two of my big drivers um, in learning are interdisciplinarity and creativity. And that's very much because of my own background, which has basically been a mix of the two. Um, so that underpins my personal philosophies. Um, as I say, I started off 15 years ago in a much more kind of, you know, with a much more traditional computer science approach, you know, teaching, programming, that kind of thing. Um, and over the years, I've gone more and more soft, I guess, when it comes to skills or soft computing. And everything I do now really is focused on digital identities, digital cultures, and trying to get learners from across disciplines working together in creative ways through the use of technology. So there's a few uh, images on there. Um, the, the one on the top right is kind of a screenshot of my, some, uh, a, a tiny part of my uh, personal learning network, people that I'm connected to around the globe through Twitter and various other platforms. And it's because of these people that I feel 
energized. I'm constantly learning. Every, you know, any time of day or night, I can tap into this network and learn something new. It's absolutely fantastic. Um, this is an example of the kind of stuff that we do in our uh, lovely shiny building at Media City UK. Um, that's a digital performance space there. And in this kind of space, we will have students from arts and sciences working together. Um, this is my favorite one here. This is quite a recent image from March last year when, um, as I say, I, I, quite, I like to sort of turn things on their heads and I'm getting really interested in the possibilities for teaching people about the internet through not using the internet. So in this case, managed to get 50 male engineering students doing ballet poses in the open air. Long story, but they did it. So um, yeah, constantly trying to sort of look at things in new ways and encouraging our learners uh, to do so as well. But as I say, the starting point um, for, for me for the last, well, since about 2006 now, has been the idea of a digital identity. You know, what does that mean? So the reason that I became very interested in digital identities um, in teaching and learning was at the time I was teaching, you know, I was uh, doing some multimedia type module um, and some of the students I, te I was teaching were making their own tracks and putting them online and they were showing me their MySpace pages and they had really good stuff on there, you know, the music tracks at the top were very impressive and then you'd scroll down and you'd see the comments and you just think, oh my God. So, and that was the thing that really did it for me. I thought, well, hang on a minute. We've got these students that are fantastic programmers, and yet they're completely missing a different kind of literacy. And in actual fact, that's a core literacy in a network society. It's digital, digital citizenship, how to communicate, how to operate online in a networked world. So in a bit of kind of, I've always called it guerrilla curriculum development because it's the sort of approach of um, seek forgiveness, not permission. Sometimes I think if you want to do something a bit challenging or innovative within a kind of uh, traditional institution program structure, sometimes it's good to kind of go under the radar otherwise things will get blocked so that's kind of what I did I reinterpreted the idea of advanced in multimedia to an advanced understanding of the internet and actually stripped away the tech side of a module and focused it entirely on web-based communication and collaboration um, that module went very well indeed that's six years ago now and we've now got sort of programs that have developed off the back of that but it was a real sort of push at first and thinking how can I do this stuff and still tick the boxes on an institutional level but identity is really really key and the reason I love working with um, our learners getting them to think about their professionalized online identity is that once they develop their online identity in this way it gives them so much ownership and autonomy there are two screen grabs there from student blogs. Um, these are a few years old now. Both of these are ex-students that we, we're in touch literally on a daily basis through different social platforms. I'll show you some examples of that um, in a bit. But what I really like about this is when we work with the students in this way, we don't use um, platforms that are owned by the institution. We actually use uh, WordPress.com, which is a free blogging platform. Um, it's up to the students whether or not they say they're a student. This is all about them learning to operate professionally and develop professional networks. So it's completely up to them. Um, but we've been doing this for a long time now and we've had so many kind of successes off the back of this. You know, learners developing a kind of confidence and an attitude through really looking out into the world, thinking of themselves as professional as opposed to thinking of themselves as learners that do an assignment and hopefully get at least a 2-1. Um, there are some examples here which um, I'll, I'll show you. I'll show you. Uh, this is, no, this is a nice one. This is Claire. She's actually a master's student now. But what I love about Claire's blog is that she started doing this for um, a module that I did with her, but she's carried on blogging. And now she blogs about lots of things from different modules. And it's really interesting to see how other academics that teach Claire are kind of becoming quite sold on the idea of this because they're able to see her thinking and her learning in a way that they couldn't ordinarily. And this is how these things kind of filter through a lot of the time. You know, it's not necessarily a from the top initiative, but it's more 
seeing who's doing what in the office next door, those kinds of networks of influence. Um, but Claire's blog is fantastic and it's actually become a wonderful resource for my current students. She writes about topics so eloquently and so accessibly. Um, and these are topics I'll be kind of talking about with current and future learners. So this whole idea about students as producers, and we're not asking Claire to do this, but the things that she comes up with are extremely valuable um, in a teaching and learning context. Here's another example. Um, this is a, well, this, Mark Weller is, he's just gone into his final year. He's, he did this when he was a second year student. He started to set up his blog. Um, and I mean, that's quite interesting there. It doesn't say, Mark Weller, I'm a student at the University of Salford. It says, Mark Weller, production, composition, cinema, editing. You know, he's setting his stall out. He's saying, this is what I want to be. And not just want to be, this is who I am really taking control of his identity. And it's fantastic, the, the, you know, the posts that he has on here, talking about all different aspects of his work. Um, and up here, we've got his showreels. I think we've got two versions on there, an audio-visual showreel, an audio showreel. And he'll const constantly update these. Now, when I first started doing the digital identity stuff, um, I was working with final year students. But a few years ago, we realized that it was almost a bit too late. What we thought was, so we've moved it now to level two. What we found is that um, at level one, there are certain issues around performance. Who are the students performing to? You know, if students 18, they're often coming in to university, but they're still very much performing to their peers. Um, in the final year, if they don't have much stuff online, it can be a bit too late to get st good stuff on there. So we found that second year is a really good time to do this. Students are, are able to identify kind of shortcomings in terms of what they haven't done, and they've got 12 months to sort it out and leave university with a really impressive professional ID. But Marx is, you know, a great example, and he regularly gets offered work on the basis um, of this site. So. And I think if we read, yeah, I mean, you read this now and you would never think that this person is a student. As I say, this was in second year. And his CV is already incredibly impressive. So, you know, there are huge benefits, I think. And it's all about bridging the kind of, you know, the, the gap between education and industry, um, learners engaging with peers or future employers in industry while they're still students. But the good thing about working with them um, in this way in education is that we can kind of guide their digital identity, okay, have awkward discussions, the kind of things that are important. Because one of the key things with this stuff is it's, it seems like it's about the technology, but really it's not. It's about human relationships. It's about communication. Um, Here's an example, um, again, with regards to the kind of boundaries blurring between education and industry. These examples are, these are screen grabs are probably about five years old now, but I really like them because they were the first time that experienced powerful eureka moments um, through Twitter. Now, two students, we've got Alex, that's his blog, on the left, Mark's blog on the right, and these two guys here played such a crucial role in a module just through um, a tweet and a comment on a blog. What had happened was, it was all in the same week, um, Mark did a review of um, an app called Audioboo, and Alex wrote a blog post about copyright and licensing in the music industry. Fine. Um, but what happened was, um, Mark came to see me a week later and he said, oh, you know that review I did, that app? And I said, yeah, yeah. And he went, this guy tweeted it and I think he might work for Audioboo. I said, oh, well, what's his name? Mark Rock. I was like, that's the CEO. And for him, that moment was, it was so empowering to think that he'd just thrown this review up there and the CEO of this company had spotted it, liked it, retweeted it. And the same week, Alex had put his copyright and licensing blog post online. And uh, he, didn't, he, he didn't make it clear that he was a student at all on his blog at this stage. So Jeremy Silver, 
um, sees this blog post and writes a really you know well informed kind of rich comment um, and they have a discussion. Jeremy Silver is one of the leading figures globally with regards um, audio and music licensing and copyright. That's a really big deal as a student to get him engaging with you on a level on your blog. So this happened in the same week and these two came to the module the following week, it must have been kind of week three of that module, told the rest of the class what, ha what had happened and all of a sudden you could feel the lift in the room, you could feel the shift from resistance to adoption and all it took was to things like that and these things happen all the time. Once you engage with networks in this way, they just happen. But the thing that students have to do is put themselves out there in order for these things to happen. But invariably, they always, always do. But some of the issues, um, Donna Boyd, very well known for her work on social networks. Um, she talks about invisible audiences and clashing contexts, and these are the, some of the real challenges, both for us and for our learners. So I'll leave you to read this quote from a student who's just about to start blogging. Okay, so I think that's a really rich quote because she's touching on several issues there. This whole idea about the kind of virtual life and the analog life. It's very easy um, away from the internet to, you know, traditionally to um, keep separate parts of our lives separate. Um, you know, we do behave differently with different people. That's a natural part of identity. If you believe that identity is fluid, which I think that most people do, it's part of, you know, being emotionally intelligent to know what you can and can't say to different people in your life. We will behave differently with our parents than with our children than with our employers. That's completely normal. But obviously the thing with the internet is it kind of can challenge all that. It can become increasingly difficult to separate those worlds. So that's one of the big challenges. And then this other idea about opening myself up to others who I don't know. Because this is something that um, I think it's getting better all the time in terms of younger people's digital literacies. But at the same time, I, I do find that still our level one students come to university with this mindset of they can write whatever they want online. It doesn't matter. It's a bit of a free for all. Um, and it's not like that at all. These things can be find, you know, found. We see you know, scare stories in the media all the time about this kind of thing. But you, know, you do have to be careful what you say in some respects, or at least be aware of consequences of what you say. This whole idea about the invisible audience I think is really powerful. You know, these texts, online texts, are not only accessible, but they're permanent in many respects. So when we're working with the learners on the kind of whole digital identity stuff, in reality, the how to set up a blog and how to post a blog post is a tiny, tiny fraction of it. Really, it's about the discussion. And, you know, I, I don't, you know, I will quite happily share embarrassing stories with my learners. I'm constantly doing stupid things on the internet, posting things to the wrong place, saying things I shouldn't, all the rest of it. It's fine, we all do it. So I think that's one of the first things, you know, don't be scared of this stuff, it's human, we are humans, it's human nature, everybody makes mistakes, it's okay. And I think once you give the learners the sort of confidence to share their stories, their horror stories, the dynamic can change entirely. Um, I mean, I had a student quite a few years ago now, who uh, it was the first year of a module, we started talking about digital identity and um, everybody started laughing at him and I couldn't work out why and I was like, come on, come on, tell me, what's this about? And it transpired that one of his friends had um, changed his name via deed poll to I'm a stapler. Um, he didn't know anything about it until he went home to his parents' house for Christmas. There was a brown envelope on the doormat, opened the envelope, and there it was. There, there it was. And it didn't cost much money at all. Uh, yeah, huge lols all round, obviously. Um, <laughs> but um, at the time, he kind of saw the funny side of it. He also enjoyed the money because he appeared in all the tabloid press. The son gave him 500 quid, and he ended up on this morning. Brilliant, fine, when you're a first-year student. 
but when he came to me, he was a final year student. And when I got them all to Google themselves, or rather Google one another, when you put his name in, you got pages and pages and pages of the I'm a stapler story. And quite frankly, he looked like a bit of an idiot. So um, through blogging um, and putting some things on YouTube, and I don't think we had Twitter then, actually. Uh, it was probably Flickr or something. But literally, after six weeks, all of these I'm a stapler results had moved down to the third page of the Google search. So it was amazing how quickly that happened. And that's another reason for our learners to really take ownership of their online identities. Because if they don't, somebody else will do it for them. And I think that's one of the strongest justifications for kind of working in this way and for helping our learners with the development of their identities. Um, another quote here. Um, it's kind of the same thing, really, but this whole idea about mixing the personal and professional, uh, feeling exposed, expressing moods and feelings to people we don't know. Again, there are no really hard, fast rules on this. I mean, I'm quite reserved online in the sense that if I'm annoyed or in a bad mood, I don't tend to express myself online. I'm much more comfortable being online when I'm happy and expressing happiness. Some people would say that's inauthentic. Um, we, we all have a different way of being on the internet. Again, that's fine. There are no hard and fast rules. Um, and I think it, you know, it demands a kind of constant reflexivity about how we want to be, who might be watching, who might be listening. I mean, I started behaving myself um, much more on Twitter a few years ago after I'd put in my National Teaching Fellowship application and the HEA started following me. And all of a sudden, I stopped letting swear words out on Twitter. I'm not just being honest, but you know, these are the kind of things that we need to. So it does demand a sort of ongoing reflexivity, being aware of the audience. You know, are your students watching you? There's a lot of behaviour modelling uh, comes into it. Um, this is an interesting one, though, and I've actually, I'll, I'll give you these slides afterwards. There's a URL here to a blog post that I wrote about this that I still haven't turned into a paper, um, but basically. The whole ethics of assessment in these types of spaces, because I used to, um, well, I still do assess projects around learners developing their digital identity, but I'm quite careful to do it in a way that doesn't penalise learners who aren't comfortable performing their identity. And it doesn't happen very often, to be fair. It's maybe one student out of 100 a year that will come and say, look, I'm really not comfortable with this. You know, here's an example here of somebody that was very reticent about working in this way. But, you know, I think it does demand, a, a, you know, we do have to think about our assessment practices um, because we're talking about people performing identity and opening themselves up. So that's something that you really need to kind of think carefully about. And I think there are ways of assessing the process of identity development without... Um, you know, it being problematic for people like this. I remember a few years ago there was one girl who was very uncomfortable about the idea of blogging publicly at all. Um, but she had a very good critical mind. So I actually said to her at the beginning of the module, well, I tell you what, if you don't want to blog publicly, you don't want to talk about yourself at all, why don't you do a kind of critical review of the module each week, how you think it's going? She said, like, OK. And she started doing that. And after about four weeks, she got used to blogging, found her voice. And then she changed tack, joined the rest of the group, and went completely public with everything. But you know, I think we, do, we have to give our learners sort of time and space when we're doing this kind of thing. There's a great quote here, though, from Claire again, um, talking about the benefits of uh, networking, and specifically Twitter, I think, in this case. So yeah, this whole idea about being able to build your professional network while you're a learner. So this is tapping into the kind of employability agenda, really. But you know, to be able to leave university with this network of contacts in your field is incredibly incredibly useful. And then, just to finish off my the session section where I evangelise the joys of digital identity development, I just want to show you a quick video produced by one of the students, because I think it's always more important to you know, hear about these things in their own words. So 
social media is a powerful tool, from the blogosphere right through to Twitter and Facebook. It helps us get our work out there to a much wider audience, whether it be images, short stories, film, or even music. A great example of this is my trailer to a short film cycle created during a university project, which has now had an audience of over 25,000 people, even if 15 of them did dislike it. Ooh. But nonetheless, it still helped me get my work out there to people that was interested in viewing it. Throughout this social technology module, we have attempted to go viral, joining the multiple social phenomenons, as well as promote ourselves as true multimedia professionals, as well as working on live briefs for companies such as the BBC. My blog and Twitter have not only helped me get my work out there for people to view and enjoy globally, but they have also helped me gain and secure job offers from clients within the industry, as well as network with people doing the job I want to be doing in the future. The main platforms I have used are Facebook, Twitter, YouTube and WordPress. I have also integrated apps to my Facebook and WordPress, such as Bandpage, which lets people stream my music for free, as well as integrating widgets for my Facebook on my blog. This then drives more traffic to my other social media websites, thus gaining a wider audience through spreadable media. So, to answer my question at the beginning of the video, social media helps you get your work out to people you wouldn't be able to about five or ten years ago. Social media even helps you get jobs at places you never thought you'd be able to get into, such as the BBC, ITV, or Google, for example. Thanks for watching, and long live the internet. Okay, I really like that video. Um, <laughs> So Mark's very, very active, uh, as you can see. Obviously, not everybody's like that. But the other thing is um, getting students to really think about getting their work out there. Very, very important. At the end of the day, they respond well to an audience because they don't want to look silly. So if they do an assignment and they think that only the tutor's going to mark it, or the dissertation, or the reader and the supervisor, you're only trying to impress two people. All you're bothered about is the mark, possibly. Um, but once we start encouraging them to use a blog as a dissertation logbook, then that changes everything because people start finding their work and they know people are watching and that drives them to kind of try harder, basically. And again, really good things can happen. I'll show you a quick example here. One of our students um, last year doing his final year project on the way that we listen to music has changed in the digital age. Um, he thought he was going to start looking at MP3s, but it actually went into the slow movement concepts of flow. It's a brilliantly rich project. But because he set up a site for it and had his survey on there and he made a documentary alongside his dissertation, people found this. I don't think he ever said that he was a student. And before he'd even finished his dissertation, when he was halfway through it, he was invited to be one of the panellists at this event, which is pretty cool. And that's a great thing for him to have on his CV. You know, so as I said, by, by developing their kind of confidence in themselves, getting them to put their work out there, the benefits can be enormous. Um, another one here that I'll, I'll just throw this in as an example. This was a second year student who obsessively makes music on his mobile phone. And what this, this here is a screen grab of a picture that he's posted to his mobile phone, to a platform called Instagram, a photo sharing app, and he just tagged it, mobile, creativity, traveling on trains gives me time to shape ideas. Now he's constantly doing this and sending these things to Twitter, always with the hashtags mobile, creativity. So anyone looking for the hashtags mobile or creativity probably got quite sick of UGFL's constant tweets about making music on his phone, or well, you'd think so, until, and this is again a second year student being invited to speak at Mobile Monday Manchester alongside leading academics and engineers and developers from the BBC as a second year student, which is amazing. And again, that's because he got his work out there. And the great thing about that is that he went to this event and everyone there was thinking about mobile learning in terms of small chunks of content delivered to a mobile device. He blew their minds when he showed them the kind of mobile learning that he does, teaching himself music composition on a device this size when he's traveling between gigs because he does roadieing, you know, spare time. So really, um, you know, important 
kind of results there, I think. But this, this has been the big game changer when it comes to operating in these digital network spaces. It's hashtag. Does anybody use Twitter or does anybody use hashtags? Okay, Brill. So, I mean, basically, you, you've seen hashtags everywhere now. TV programs, when they start, there'll be a hashtag on the bottom of the screen. Um, it's because that's how we engage now. We engage in this constant network of kind of ambient communication. And the whole idea of the second screen, you know, we don't really, well, lots of people don't just watch TV anymore. They like to be able to sit there and bitch about what's going on on the screen with their friends. And to do this, they'll use a hashtag. Then everybody uh, can kind of join in this big discussion. But hashtags are incredibly useful. You know, on Twitter, big hashtags are like hash edtech or hash scichat, you know, a 24-7 chat about science. You know, there are many, many, many hashtags that enable networks of people around the world to constantly follow a key word and dip in and out of a discussion. It's such a powerful tool and it's a powerful way to aggregate across different platforms through a keyword. But hashtags, um, as I say, they've kind of changed everything. Um, for, for me and for us and for many other people because now we're seeing the rise of, you know, modules. Do you call your, do you, do you use the word modules here? Mod courses, okay. Courses. So now we see many people starting to give their course a hashtag. Now obviously we get our course codes from, you know, central admin, which we need to operate within our university system, but more and more people are developing their own course codes, um, which means that they can um, basically tweet about their course or whatever else, and this has changed a lot of things, I think. I mean, CCK08, you've probably all heard the term MOOC, that was really the first MOOC it was what we called a connectivist MOOC. It was all about connecting people rather than about Coursera and Udacity making lots of money. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, that was one of the first MOOCs. Uh, DS106 um, is this MOOC that has been going on for years now. It's incredible. It's all around digital storytelling. That's kind of from the States, but in increasingly people all around the world are joining this. And that never really stops or starts, you know, students suggest assignments, people can dip in and out any time, it's amazing. Uh, the one in the middle is for one of my courses, which is the MSc course, MSc Research in Emerging Technologies. Um, and by using this hashtag for my course on Twitter, um, people are able to connect and dip in and out. The interesting thing is the module never really ends. We have our 12-week modules with assessment at the end, but students, when they finish the module, will still carry on kind of sharing content and everything with that hashtag. And as new students come in, they start using that hashtag. So you get a community that builds up around the course, and then you start getting peer mentoring occurring, which is really nice to see. So, um, I mean, this is stuff, it's kind of alumni gold. I mean, okay, may not have a financial implication, but in terms of alumni relationships and peer mentoring, and um, through developing these relationships across networks and through students connecting with one another over time, I still have students from six or seven years ago now um, basically as mentors on my current modules and they do that through digital networks by communicating with and advising current students. So that's a real shift there, the rise of the hashtag as a course identifier and that enables us to easily connect with learners all around the world and I'll show you some examples of that now. So to finish off I'm just going to run you sort of quite quickly through two projects iColab and Elvis. So these are international collaborations. These are communities of practice. They're not funded, but this is, in both cases, it's a group of like-minded academics from across the world coming together to co-create courses and co-deliver courses. The ultimate goal is to get our learners to develop new ways of seeing, to look at the same kind of technological phenomena in new ways because essentially all of our learners are based within their own disciplinary confines in a sense but they're all using the same tools but by getting them to work together they're basically looking at these tools through multiple lenses it's a much richer way of experiencing technology so um, it's all about learning from different disciplinary perspectives 
and cultures. So first of all, um, that's the wrong, the wrong graphic there. Um, I collab, so international collaboration. It's not the most uh, imaginative hashtag, but it serves a purpose. Um, this started, we've been doing this for about three years now. And at first it was a collaboration between us at the University of Salford, um, Unitech in New Zealand, the University of, let's see, uh, Academy of Applied Sciences in Berlin, and um, the University of Tarragona in Barcelona. Students ranging from um, um, masters in education to masters of web science, undergraduate acoustics and audio production, and um, MA architecture. So very different disciplines. And what we did, we got the learners to do little kind of technology projects for one another, which would give them an insight on the technologies in their particular contexts. So the first thing we did was ask them to make little introduction videos for one another. So I'll show you one now. And there's a reason for showing you this. It's all about imperfection. Studying a master in audio production this year. We're doing this video for the social. I'm not sure what just happened there. Have you got any idea? The whole screen go down. Mm -hmm. hey, everyone, I'm Jorge Borrios from Spain, and I'm here in the University of Salford studying a master in audio production this year. We're doing this video for the social media module here in Media City, UK in a, an acoustic sculpture called uh, Aeolus and here we are of the pipes which as, as you can hear it represents it's quite cool <laughs> so pleased to meet you and we'll show you more of things about Mini Media City later see ya <laughs> no no I, I've got mine already <laughs> I love that because it's so imperfect. You know, it all goes a bit wrong at the end, the camera falls over. Brilliant. And that's something, that's one of the other things. People often don't have the confidence to use these tools in these ways or operate in these spaces. And that's another really important thing to realize um, that um, people actually love things that are imperfect. In a world where everyone's got a digital camera and it's very easy to make stuff that's kind of quite good, um, people see it as more authentic a lot of the time. So there's a lot of joy in that. And that actually goes back, um, got a, yeah, this is from Making, it's worth reading this book, Making is Connecting by David Gauntlet, because he's talking about the joy of kind of everyday creativity, vernacular creativity, and Web 2.0. And he traces it right back to um, Ruskin and Morris, the Victorian social critics, who you know, almost saw creativity as a human right. And one of the issues with creativity is that um, you know, it has been uh, professionalized. And in many cases, if things aren't really, really good, they're derided. Well, actually, that's nonsense. But it's one of the things that holds us back from using these tools a lot of the time. And it's just the lack of confidence. And oh, well, what if it's not very good? So what? People love stuff that's not very good. Most things on the internet are not very good. You know, those pictures of cats are really pixelated, but people love them. So that should never hold us back. Um, yeah, knowledge creation. This is another thing that we can open up. <laughs> that we can open up through. It's just big words. <laughs> But yeah, um, another thing that we did um, with this project, first of all, was to get the learners um, yeah, sharing their learning with one another in different ways. So here's an example where what we'd do was um, get them to crowdsource lecture notes. So this was one week I was talking to them about um, you know, digital kind of convergence. And in order to get them to develop what we'd call Twitter literacies, ask them all to tweet the lecture. So all it takes is one learner to tweet, say, every two minutes, and at the end of the session, you've got loads and loads of tweets, which basically cover everything that you've said. One person wouldn't be able to do that unless they could write in shorthand. And then what we do at the end is pull these tweets into a tool called Storyfy, 
um, which then basically packages them chronologically, save them as week six convergence, and then send them to the students in different countries, in New Zealand, in Australia, in Spain, in Germany. And they do the same thing with us. And then we'd all have a look at one another's lectures in this way. And again, the really nice thing about this is that you get the human element. So this one, I'll read it out to you. I'm not in the mood for the world today or uni. Might be a bit grumpy later, chaps. Blah, blah, blah. Well, that's brilliant because you kind of remember your course notes. If you've got the odd bit, bit of humanity in there, it makes it much less dry. Um, so I, I really like that, the fact that we get their personalities kind of creeping in. But by you know, passing these um, notes to one another in this way, the collaborative lecture notes, they're able to, again, learn from one another. Um, another example here in terms of opening up the classroom. Um, the other thing that happens when you start using hashtags on your courses is that undergraduate and postgraduate students start seeing what one another are doing, and the keen ones will get really interested. So I always get now like maybe a few undergrads in a module are really keen. They'll be following postgrad hashtags, and they start getting really curious. And they, can we come to the postgrad class as well? Well, brilliant. You know, if there are spare seats in the room, then please do so. Why should you be limited by you know the level that you're on? You know, please do engage with others. So that's great. The second one down is from a po an ex student attending a postgrad class, because the other thing is the ex students follow the hashtags and then start communicating with current students. They start getting to know one another, and then this great community develops, and then they want to come back to school and meet the students, which is completely bizarre. It's brilliant. And then finally, back to the point about mobile learning. About this, this is a great example of mobile learning as something that's just truly mobile. I hope the MSCSM lecture will be tweeted so I can keep up whilst delayed on public transport. So I really like that example there. Um, in terms of openness. Another thing that we do, um, which is a really useful exercise in information literacy, but with the blogs, um, you know, years ago, if I was with a MSc class, I'd um, give them a load of journal paper references for a topic. Now I'll just give them three and ask them to go away that week and find a paper um, each student and then blog about it, you know, critical analysis of this paper, why they think it's useful. It's a fantastic exercise and it means that we've got a very rich bibliography that everybody has contributed to by the end of the course. I'm going to skip this because I've just noticed the time. I felt like I had loads of time and then I think I've taken far too long. There was another example there basically of a very imperfect video once again that the whole class produced and then this woman um, got in touch to say, can your students do a series from my blog? It was even rougher than the first one I showed you. Anyway, it turns out she's kind of this big gun in the States on TV all the time, but loved the authenticity of it. So that was amazing for the learners to see that happening. iColab 12, the next iteration, and this was a true, true collaboration this time. Um, this is us in an example Google Hangouts. So because we're in different time zones, we use Google Hangouts um, to meet up at night and kind of plan what we're going to do with our learners. Um, in this case, we got the students all to do work on transmedia reports, so across multiple platforms, basically, on social media in my industry, in my city. And then they all had to kind of swap uh, reports and rate them and the winners in each country get an iTunes voucher. But again, it was a much richer way for them to learn about the internet from multiple perspectives. So they share work via Twitter using the iColab hashtag. There's a screen grab of a report there. This was at 11 p.m. at night and lots of the students in the UK tuned in to watch the students in New Zealand give their presentations at 9 a.m. They were really interested. We find that they love to connect with students around the world. It's the one thing that they always say, oh, I love doing that, can we do that again? They absolutely love it every time. Um, some more, oh, this was this year. We, what we found this year was that our semester dates just didn't work at all. We couldn't collaborate at the same time. So we tried a different approach. We constantly try new, new approaches. And this time we called it like the relay approach. So students in Ireland started, groups of students, was about 50 um, students in 10 groups. And they each worked on a project about some aspect of digital culture and when they'd finished uh, my students then went and commented and rated their projects and then my students working in groups selected one of their projects and then built on it 
and then spent four weeks working on that again and it then passed on to New Zealand and it, I think it might still be ongoing actually it's just this thing that goes on and on but this whole idea about building on one another's knowledge uh, is really powerful I'm skipping through these now I'm sorry um, so the final example, Elvis, Entertainment Lab for the Very Small Screens. This is a group of us around the world that are very, very interested in mobile phone filmmaking from different perspectives. Um, but yeah, we've been working together for three years now and this one is really growing. We've actually added Columbia into the mix now, which makes it very challenging in terms of time zones. We've got about a two hour window each day when we can actually meet. Um, but yeah, the first year, uh, 2011, was basically a teaching exchange. So I just did some guest lectures for them via the internet, which was fun because that was at three in the morning on a Monday morning because of the time difference. <laughs> and then it acted as a critical friend for their students, giving them feedback on their work, etc. But, but basically that went really well and we decided that we'd like to you know, push this further. So in 2012, um, we had about 50 students working on, um, 50 students from New Zealand, France, Germany and the UK, working in international teams to create mobile phone films on the topic of sustainability. The reason we picked that topic was because it had nothing to do with any of their degrees, they were all from different disciplines, but it was a topic of global concern. Um, so I'll just take you through some slides very quickly now. That screenshot there is our first mass Google Hangout. You should only have 10 people in a Google Hangout, but actually, if you all squeeze in round one laptop, you can get at least 50. We got 120 this year. Um, but yeah, that was the first time the students all met. And so the students in... Um, in the UK and France were there with beer because it was like eight at night and the students in New Zealand were there with croissants, you know, building the bridges with the French. It's all very nice. So yeah, that was the first time they met and then they had to work together on these films. Um, and the outputs were hilarious in many cases, but it was all about collaboration and they just used free open platforms. It was basically Google Docs, Google Hangouts, filming on the devices in their pockets, publishing on YouTube, nothing cost anything. And yeah, you know, it really kind of pushed them to develop these skills in intercultural working, intercultural communication, collaboration, creativity. Um, have I just clicked on a link? <gasps> All oh, right. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, that's just, that's. This is this is the blog uh, for Elves Twelve. The, the the different films that were produced. So yeah, that was a quite a cool project. Um, I'll just give you a bit of a flavour. This is an example kind of student Google Docs. We've got students from different countries here, all deciding what they what they're going to do for their film. And I love this. Like, we just need a vegetable that looks like it has a moving mouth. Like if you cut a kiwi in half, and then you can make it speak by moving each half. You know, like South Park. Very simple movements. We can add the voice. But seeing them go into this detail with one another and people that they've never, ever met face to face. Uh, I think it's just, it's really special. Um, and these are example documents from the tutor's side. So these are all our planning documents and papers. And we open them up to the learners. So the learners can see what we're doing. It's all very transparent. The other thing that we did, which may horrify you, because it horrified me at first, was we had a YouTube account for this project. So over 50 students involved. And we gave them all the username and password for the YouTube accounts. So they could upload videos. So there's trust for you. And nobody abused it, but I always get nervous when I say things like that because I'm sure one day somebody will. But no, I mean, as I say, I think, you know, there's a lot of trust. If you build these networks, there's trust within the networks. Um, and the students do kind of appreciate being treated as adults, as equals. Um, this is an example, pictures from a student hang out. There's some students meeting about their film. But the other thing we do is... We start to merge the communities of practice, so we start inviting the students to our hangouts, and then they start inviting us to theirs, and that's when it gets really, really special. The students, it's kind of behaviour modelling in a sense, so by students attending our meetings and our Google Hangouts, they're sort of learning how to operate in this space. So, yeah, that's quite cool and then they do these reflective videos at the end so speculate on the role internationally collaborative movie making might play in affecting cultural change 
um, so they put these on YouTube so it's all very open and then to finish off I'll show you something that still terrifies me now um, this year's Elvis project involved over a hundred students from three universities in New Zealand Salford in the UK, the University of Bogota, Colombia, and the University of Strasbourg in France. Okay, get this. Creating the visual backdrop for an eight-act opera, which was premiered in London in August, entirely shot and edited on mobile devices in international teams. And I still feel a bit <laughs> panicky when I say it because it was, it was absolutely crazy. I'll just show you the blog quickly now. Um, so yeah, here's Elvis, the Elvis 13. So here's the roster. Here we go. <laughs> One opera, eight acts, eight teams. And I've lost count of the number of groups. It got completely manic. And so here are all the students um, and the particular themes for their act. Now each group, this is about as right brain as you can get. Each group was given the soundtrack for their act with a one word descriptor. That was it. And 12 of them had to come together and try and negotiate making the visual backdrops. So you can imagine how much fun that was in some cases. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've had the most surreal discussions with students you know, within this project. Very odd discussions. How do you represent sex? And you talk about this 10 o'clock at night in a Google Hangout with nine students thinking, this is the weirdest conversation to be having with a group of students. But, you know, we got there. We got there. Um, and it was, uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a really fun project. The final outputs are here. There's the kind of final compilations from all the groups and then the sort of highly edited version and then it actually being performed um, in August. But that was incredibly challenging really really challenging and I'd love to do something like that again um, we all, you know on these sites these are all open sites we've got all the student links to their blogs their reflections oh another good thing to point out actually one of the things that holds us back when we're thinking about you know using technologies in these ways we, we think oh it's going to take loads of time I haven't got the time but this kind of networked or distributed approach means that the time is kind of spent differently. That's what we've found. And what we've found with these projects in particular is that at the end of the project, each lecturer will do a five to ten minute feedback video for everybody, so the students in all the countries. What that happens when you, when, you put the lecture, when you put the feedback videos together, they end up with about 45 minutes of video feedback, and they absolutely love it. And I've specifically said to them, you know, how do you feel about having this instead of the written feedback? They are fine with that. What we'll do, we'll give them generic feedback and sort of say, these are the characteristics of a really good assignment, you know, uh, one of the poor assignment, the middle ones. If you want more specific feedback, just let me know. And they rarely ever do. They are so satisfied with that as a form of feedback. So it actually saves a great deal of time because we all know it's the kind of the writing and the comments. And, you know, once you've done that 70 or 100 or possibly even more times in a row, it gets a bit much. So by kind of sharing the work between the lecturers, we do save a lot of time in that respect and the students really appreciate it. So just to finish off, I'm going to go, this is, um, this is a tool for thinking really from Ron Barnett, whose work I absolutely love. Um, and he talks about kind of super complexity. You know, we live in this age of uncertainty, unknowing, uh, rapid change, and how do we prepare our learners for this world? Now, in the first box, so you know, this is a, you know, risk and transformation. The first box, we're essentially looking at the kind of educational logic at work, aims, objectives, and that's got this kind of latent function of, you know, um, being a very risk-free environment for our learners. And that's the environment within which we operate for lots of good reasons, including QA purposes, but it's only one part of the kind of the world that we live in. Um, when we move into the second box, we're essentially looking at a riskier approach. Um, it's academic, say, research or something. But essentially, um, our learners might be looking at the unknown, but they're still doing it within the confines of a discipline, and there is certainty in that discipline. Down here, we've got generic skills, this idea of fixed ontologies. 
for an unknown world. So the whole, you know, generic skills are incredibly important. I've described some of these things today in terms of the digital identity development, digital citizenship, but we're kind of preparing learners for uncertainty through certainty. And then there's this box. Now, this is what really interests me, open ontologies for an unknown world. This is about human being. It's post-curricular. It's hidden curriculum behind prescribed curriculum in a sense. But this is about learners having confidence, learners having you know, an attitude, a sense of self, a way of being. And I think that out of all the projects we've done, that opera project is the only one that's really moved into this fourth space. It's very hard to move into this fourth space. But by giving learners, um, a, I was going to say project, but I'll call it a problem, because actually, I didn't tell you that the soundtrack was constantly being changed until the last minute, which totally frustrated them. Learners were missing one another in Hangouts all the time. There were all sorts of issues. It was also extremely rewarding and exhilarating for them, but it was a very, very challenging pro uh, process and very, very tense. But for those that really kind of engaged with that project, I think they've moved into this fourth space and there's been a noticeable kind of shift in terms of their self-efficacy, their self-perception and their self-confidence. I think that's incredibly important. So I'm going to leave it by just kind of summing up when it comes to these networked collaborations. Now I don't know what the situation's like in Greenwich, but I know for us at Salford, you know, we have an extremely poor rate of kind of outgoing Erasmus students, for instance. And I think it's the same all over the UK, really, because, you know, that we, we aren't as a real language speakers um, in the way that other, you know, European countries are. And so, um, I think, you know, that's a real problem. And by engaging in these spaces in these ways, it gives our students at least a flavour of internationalisation at home as they start learning about one another's cultures. Um, this hybrid approach, you know, these aren't MOOCs, but uh, equally it's not learning confined within four walls. It's a, it's a kind of hybrid approach. And I think it harnesses the benefits of both, really. We get the face-to-face -face relationships and the safety as belonging to an institution, but also the kind of hand-holding to move out there and operate within networks, form connections, and develop awareness across disciplines along with these kind of cultural and digital literacies. Um, I don't think I've got time to go into this really, have I? So I'd best leave it there for today. Um, thank you very much for listening. We'll make these slides available to you, obviously. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, to be honest with you, I, I've actually become less concerned about this as time goes on because I think that it's very much this idea of almost diffusion of innovation and although, we, although it's important to support things centrally and drive things centrally, you know, we also like to feel autonomous um, and so I think that colleague to colleague is a much more kind of influential process than top down a lot of the time and then also as these technologies are being adopted we're just seeing them people just using them more and more and more so that used to bother me a lot but actually it bothers me less and less and less and I'm just in fact I will just show you one of those slides now because it'll help kind of answer that sort of question. This is um, a photo sharing app called Instagram. And I was reading a paper by Mark Murphy at the University of Glasgow, who's the reader in social and educational policy. It's a fantastic paper, Troubled by the Past, History, Identity in the University. I loved this paper, so I took a photo, put it on Instagram, um, and then uh, I, I called her a colleague, but I'd never met her, somebody else at the university that followed me on there. So that paper looks really interesting. What's it called? And now they're going away to read that paper. Now, this form of emergent knowledge sharing is something that, I mean, I spoke to our uh, Senate last week, and they were absolutely gobsmacked by this as an example of the emerging forms of knowledge sharing that are going on within an institution between academics from different disciplines and different departments. So, as I say, I'm getting less and less worried about this stuff all the time. 
time. It does just happen. But at the same time, I think everybody just needs an in. And for some people, they might be visual people that like sharing photos. Some people might really enjoy Twitter. Some people might enjoy using a social bookmarking service. But I always think, just find a tool that you like, experiment with it. And once people have developed the confidence in that tool, then they start adopting others. I think that's the way to do it, rather than say to people, right, I want you to start putting your pictures on internet, videos on YouTube, bookmark everything. That's too much. Just one tool, I think, is enough as the in. So, yeah.